Praise the Lord. I'm going to answer a few of these questions. So why not just sit down? Now, I can't answer all these questions, but I'll read some of them. Can a pastor have a traveling ministry and still be a successful local pastor? How often can such a pastor be away from his congregation <laughs> with his traveling ministry? Now, you're going to get me in trouble because if some of you are traveling uh, too much and I say the wrong thing, then you're going to be mad at me. But, uh, you know, I, I've discovered for myself that I have to be here uh, with the congregation, you know. But I know pastors that do travel a lot and they, they do have churches. They don't have real large churches, but they have good churches. But uh, for myself, I stay here. Can I have an amen? amen. Uh, what is your opinion, the key to successful evangelism in a city is city in the world. Well, we just, uh, we just, you know, we just teach everybody to go out and witness for Jesus, just like Larry there. And, and they get full of the word here. You saw about 30 or 40 churches, many of them right here in this area started from, from, from this church right here. And they're just doing what the Bible says. So it's really not hard. Just preach the word and let people act on it. Can I have an amen? Here's a really, pastor, how do you get racism out of your church? How do you get black ministers and white ministers to come together? Sunday is the day when we go back to either black or white churches. You know, that's not true. Uh, you know, they say it's the most segregated. Maybe it is, but not in Holy Ghost churches. I mean, I, we don't have any trouble with racism. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter to me what color Dodie is. I'm going to live with her. I mean, I tell you, folks, when you have preached the love of Jesus, you don't have any trouble. We have all races in our church, and we never even think about race. Where there's grace, there's no race. Thank God. So, so, so just, just, preach, just preach in love. Love. People of other races than you are know whether you love them or not. And we have, we have all kind of races that listen to our television come here. Now let's see. Um, oh, here's a blessing to me. I didn't know I did this, but uh, not a question, Brother, brother Osteen, but uh, just a, a thank you. Five years ago, you wrote a person, uh, a letter of encouragement uh, to a missionary who uh, had lost his wife. You encouraged him to stay on the field uh, and, the Lord, and, and serving the Lord. And you said you were praying for him because of your encouragement. He stayed on uh, stayed on, and we met, evidently this is from the wife, we met, uh, and now we are serving the Lord together. Isn't that good? Always take time to encourage people. Anybody can criticize, encourage them. Give that person a hand clap, would you? Oh, here's a good one. What is your view concerning the balance of power and authority between the pastor and his board? Well, I don't have a board, so I don't know. There's no place in the Bible you can find the word board. One time when I was a Baptist, we did have a board, and I asked the board to meet me after church, and a strange man showed up. I said, what are you doing here? You said you asked for the board. I've never been so bored with your preaching in all my life. <laughs> but I, I do not believe that, 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 that businessmen are anointed to run a church. Amen. I do not believe. I think they're... I think they can give advice. I think they're good people. I think they can be a blessing to us and hold up our hands. But uh, uh, I, I, just, I just don't believe in boards. Now, we do have a group of people that set the salaries of our family here. And, uh, but, but uh, you know, if you have an advisor board and they don't do what you say, you get another one. <laughs> you're not, uh, you're, you know that. Now, the government knows that. You know, if they don't agree with you, you just change boards. That's right. I mean, that's the reason I don't have an advisor board, because I know that I, if they don't do what I, I want to do for the Lord, I'm going to get another one. But, but there is, now, now my opinion, you, you know, I don't know everything, but I, I can't find anywhere in the Bible 
where it says have a board. Not even have a board of deacons. We have wonderful deacons in this church, but we don't have meetings with them. They just deek. <laughs> wonderful people. I used to sit in a Baptist church and was they, I didn't even have a vote in the deacons meeting. No matter what vision I had, they had, to, they had to prove it. I feel sorry for people like that. And I don't think Holy Ghost people ought to have to put up with that. Well, I made some enemies, I guess, but anyway, I spoke my piece. Somebody said, did you give somebody a piece of your mind? Yep, that's the reason you don't have much left. You give so many pieces away. <laughs> Concerning finances, what percentage of money should be saved, defended church money? Caroline Aycock, you asked that. I didn't mean to give you a name. <laughs> but I know, where, where's Caroline? I know her real well. Caroline, where are you? And there she is. Uh, are you giving any training or instruction to the prayer and home leaders? Yeah, we do. We do. We have a, a list of uh, uh, things that we suggest, you know, and um, ask them to follow the Holy Ghost, but we have those things. Well, we, we, everybody can just determine. I think, <clears throat> I think uh, that you ought to always uh, function to where you can have a little reserve, at least some reserve, and then finally build up more and more. I don't think you have to have a cut and dried amount. Just follow the Lord. What is your pastoral structure to care for all the wonderful sir, uh, people in your church? What was, the, <clears throat> what was the process of supporting more and more ministers and missions, uh, reaching out to the nations? Uh, how did it grow? By the way, you are having a greater influence on ministries than you know. Thank you for hosting this conference. <laughs> I appreciate that. I like those good little extra words in there. <clears throat> uh, um, well, you know, we, God just put everything together. Our family does most of the, uh, our heads of departments here. Dodie and I, of course, work together here. And, and uh, Justin here is the administrator. Stand up, Justin, so they can see you, you're good looking and like your daddy. Praise the Lord. And then uh, Lisa, of course, she's the head of about a thousand uh, volunteer ministries. Stand up, Lisa. And uh, then... Um, Tamara and Jim, they moved away from us. They're down in, uh, in Victoria. Y'all stand up so we'll know who you are anyway. Praise the Lord. They're doing a wonderful work down there. And then uh, Gary, and, Gary and April are youth pastors, and uh, he directs the music. Gary, you stand up. And by the way, his tapes out there, his new CDs, and his, his uh, uh, cassettes out there, you want to take him home with you. And let me see. Um, Joel, our younger son, is the head of television. Who else is in our family? Uh, oh, yeah, our son Paul's a doctor in Little Rock. But uh, anyway, <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, we just, um, we, we, we have a wonderful staff in missionary work, just, just grew naturally and gradually and, and um, kept on giving more and more. What if a minister is caught in known sin? How long is he supposed to stay out of the ministry? Is there any scriptural basis? Well, if the man be overtaken in the fall, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Just love. Love will never fail. I don't think anybody ought to be condemned to hell forever and, 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 and laid aside. Most people who make a mistake know they need to step aside until the you know, they get confidence, but uh, our business is to restore, not to condemn, and not to condone. And if they have a habit of that, then there's a difference in befalling and having a habit. Was there a time when you had God speak to you and to move on to another level without enough money, but God said move, the people would understand, begin to leave the ministry, what did you do? Well, you know, if God speaks to me, I just stay with it. And let people leave. They want to leave, fine. Doesn't leave anybody but me and Dodie here. We'll make it. You know, you just have to go on. If God, if God really spoke to, you, spoke to you now, 
Here's an interesting question. Can uh, the devil steal life when, um, when God is our life, especially when they're not making any wrong choices? I think what they mean is when people die early, is it a sign the devil did it or so forth and so on? I, there's a mystery about people dying early. I don't know. Doesn't always mean that the devil did it. Sometimes they have a secret with God. I don't know. But uh, we ought not to be critical. If they die early, just say, well, thank God they went to heaven. And uh, David said, I don't exercise myself in too, uh, matters too high for me. We, we've had people die early here in the church, so I just go on. We just thank God they're in heaven. Any suggestion about maintaining victory during the the two hardest times of life in ministry, when the minister hurts your children. And, um, and when people who have stood with you uh, then turn against you. That's hard, isn't it? If anybody mistreats our children, we kill them. <laughs> no, Dodie said she wants me to quit talking about killing people. And uh, she's shaking her finger at me now. Her face is dark. I, I command that little dark cloud to get off of Dodie. <laughs> you know, we don't want to know what everybody says. Don't try to find out what everybody says. Better to be ignorant. The Bible said, don't try to know every word unless you hear your servant cursing you. So, you know, it hurts when people hurt your children. And people just turn away from it. We had close friends when we got to baptism in the Holy Ghost, real close friends. They never spoken to us to this day. I mean, when you will go on with God, a lot of people are not going to go, but uh, just walk in love. Huh? Oh, if, you, if those people murmur at you, tell them about the snakes. You know, when they murmured in the Old Testament, God sent snakes to bite them. So remind them of snakes. That was Dodie's suggestion. <laughs> what is the most effective and powerful thing you can do as a pastor to, to, to cause tremendous growth in church? That's what I'm preaching about all during this meeting here. How long do you, this is real interesting, how long do you spend in sermon preparation? What is the best means of getting sermon ideas? <laughs> I preach all the time here, and uh, I never worry about, I, the, 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 my least worry is, is getting a message. I read the Bible every day, and just sit and read it, and, and mark it, and let God talk to me, and then I just share whatever God tells me, you know. That's how to do it. I mean, I... Uh, if you'll call it, uh, if you'll call it, uh, I don't preach sermons. I get messages. If you have a revelation from God, share it with the people. And so uh, that, that's the best way. Just, just stay full of God. I've got so much to preach. If I preach every day from now till doomsday, I'm telling you, I wouldn't run out. But have you ever been to a time it seemed like you uh, preached all the Bible? Nothing, nothing left. You preach it from Genesis to Revolution. I mean, there's nothing left. That's a time when you just ought to go to Psalms and just praise God. Just read them and praise, and 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 praise and praise, and laugh at the devil, and laugh at the devil. Read them and praise, and laugh at the devil, and get up and dance a little bit. It'll all come back to you. Uh, so many things are important for a church. Uh, and if there was one thing that stands out more than anything to make it successful, what would it be? I'm preaching about that today. If I, uh, you know, the successful things, I mean, the secrets of su successful church. Do you teach on uh, a lot on submission and authority? To Dodie, but it doesn't work. <laughs> Dodie's saying, yes. No, you can go to seed on that. You know, our people are so good. And, and you know, if you, if you live a life before them and, 
and uh, ask for them courteously to listen to you, they will. They will. They'll do it. And uh, you can go to seed on submission. You know, uh, we're to submit to one another. And, um, and of course, we know the pastor is the head of the church. I am the head of this church. And, um, and I ask kindly for people to do things, and they do it. What, uh, what caused the explosion of your church so forth uh, in growth? I, we're talking about that during these days. Dodie spoke about 200 prayer warriors in the church, or prayer partners we call them. My question is, what are the rule guidelines for being a prayer par- uh, warrior or partner if you have uh, rules and pr- guidelines? Barbara and Guthrie, Barbara Guthrie and William are the head of our prayer partners. They're not here today. They'll be here tonight probably. And uh, we do have rules. Uh, uh, do, uh, Lisa hand, handles all of that. We have guidelines and also for the home prayer meetings. And uh, so I don't know whether you have a, nobody has anything. I mean, yeah, we have guidelines and policies for everything we do around here so we know where we're going. If you were starting a new work, believing that God wanted you to start a new work, uh, uh, what would the, the thing or things be that you would do to ensure success? Just feed the sheep. I'm, feed the sheep and pray for the sick and cast out devils. And I tell you, God will send people to you. How often does your staff meet and how uh, does impartation of the vision and, uh, and function take place? I, I don't know. They just in church so much they know the vision. I tell you, they pray the first hour of the day and and uh, every once in a while, Justin meets with them, and we all meet together and pray. And, and um, we just, I mean, we're just like a family. Are you all enjoying this? Yeah. You don't sound like it. <laughs> uh, we pastored 11 years successfully. Five years ago, the Lord, uh, Spirit definitely said, step down and and, uh, and, and full-time, do tra- full-time travel and missionary evangelist work. However, we have n- had not had many doors open. And um, so, uh, but they have a successful ministry. Well, you've got to be sure God tells you. You know, you get tired in, the, in, in a church pastoring all these years, you know. You know, sometimes you just... Uh, like Brother Hagin says, it seems like you're washing your feet with your socks on. And sometimes the devil will talk you into moving to what you think is greener pastures, but be sure God leads you. I tell people, always before you resign, take a month's vacation and get away. Travel all over the world if you can. And then you might be glad to come back to a church. <laughs> so, so I don't know. Uh, it, it, You'll learn something out there. Well, have a hard time, but you'll learn. What a timely and anointed message last night. What about outside ministers always calling for speaking engagements? How do you tactfully say no? Well, I just say, uh, you know, I'm preaching. (laughs) We don't have many outside ministers. Our people here don't come during the week. Uh, you, you say, well, why don't they? I don't know why, but they don't come. If we have anything, we have it, uh, try to have it Monday, Wednesday, I mean uh, Sunday and, and Wednesday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, when they all come. Not very many people come otherwise. Sometimes when Brother Shambach comes, a few more come, because he knows how to holler and shout. And, and he's, a, he's a fanatic, you know. But, uh, but, but we, we shy away. And uh, I tell you, I got so much to tell this congregation. Very seldom do we ever have anybody else preaching. We'll have people come and share a few minutes. Even missionaries that come. We have them share five minutes, but I do the preaching. They, you know, when they come off the field, they don't need to be preaching. They need to be fed. But now some of them here will be preaching in churches, which is good. But uh, I just say, well, you know, I'm preaching Sunday. I'm preaching. 
If God leads me, I do have. Now, I know these people do need a place to preach, but I have to do what God tells me to do. And I know some of you traveling ministries may not like that, but if God led me to have you, I would. But I've got to be led. And God does have churches He wants you to be in. Everybody's not like Lakewood. Perhaps the most difficult thing for me to release responsibilities to others. I find myself doing it all myself. Uh, when I see it hasn't been done. And uh, so forth. How do I release it? Well, you just have to learn. Just trust somebody to do it. I just got it all released here till I don't have anything to do. <laughs> somebody said, no wonder your kids do it all. And our kids remind me, said, no wonder you have an easy time. We do all the work. How many buildings did you go through before you got to this one? Well, we, we built one 75 by 100 and then doubled it and then doubled that and then we moved over here. What are some of the prayers you pray over your congregation and do you pray them daily? I don't do anything daily except read my Bible and pray. I don't try to get in a habit uh, of doing something the same way all the time. Just enjoy God. We do pray for the God to bless the congregation, staff. This, uh, I'm answering some of these questions here. How do you raise up leaders in your church? I mean, they just sit here till they get so full, they just rise up. I mean, they get, they get full of God and just want to go out and do something for God. What negative things do you tolerate in your staff and key leaders? Nothing. <laughs> we do not have negative attitudes in our staff. And we are so blessed because we let the Holy Ghost lead them here. This is the end of side one. Please turn your cassette over at this time. Brother Hagin said in 1996 in the winter camp we should not clap. Now what do you want me to do? Get in an argument with Brother Hagin? <laughs> Why well, I go to Brother Hagin's meeting and they clap? I did more clapping at his meeting than any other time. I was there. Don't tell me they didn't clap. What Brother Hagin is saying is there are two kinds. When you clap, you know. And there's a far different realm in raising your hands and worshiping God. And there is a realm of worship and praise and adoration of God that is beyond clapping. That's all he means. And if all you do is clap, 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 but then there ought to be a time when we adore the Lord, when we praise his holy name, when we lift our hands and worship him. I don't disagree with Brother Hagin at all. Uh, when your children were teenagers, how did you balance ministry and family life? We find that as teenagers, our children sometimes resent dad's profession, even though they're wonderful children and love the Lord. You know, we just never had any trouble. People said, just wait till your children get to be teenagers and drive a car. You're going to have trouble. No, when they got to be teenagers and drove a car, just kept us from driving. They did all the errands. They went to the school. They picked people up. They went to the grocery store. They did all these wonderful things. And, and, and I tell you, if you'll just love children, set a good example for them, they, they'll be wonderful children. They'll be wonderful children. And we never had any conflict in our family about family life and, and, and the ministry because, because they, just, they just knew we all, we were real at home just like we were at church. What do you do with one of your church leaders that continually cause trouble? Boys, I've been wondering about you. <laughs> well, you know, if a person, if a person causes trouble, I, I would talk to them. I, I haven't had anybody like that. They, 
I'd talk to them and reason with them and then, and then pray over them and pray for God to move them out. <laughs> and, and you know, if they can't fit into the vision, they need to be someplace else. They, maybe they're just out of the will of God. How did God get great, such great love for people into you and Dodie and your family? Pastor and Dodie, you two have more love for, uh, for us visiting ministers and the saved and the unsaved. How'd that happen? I don't know. I just, I just, I don't know. God just put love in us. <laughs> I guess uh, it's God is love. And we just thank God we do love people. But that's a great compliment. We, Pastor Austin, please show, share on keeping your marriage alive in the ministry. I've been trying to resurrect ours for quite a while. <laughs> oh, Dodie wrote that. She did not. <laughs> don't deny, don't deny. You know, we, we argue and fuss and carry on, you know, uh, but we just do it from the neck up and, uh, you know, we love each other. I'll tell you, the answer to a good marriage is love. We love. And uh, I know Dodie lies a lot, but uh, <laughs> she has never told me one time that I preached a bad sermon. That's the reason I said she lies a lot, but, but, uh, but we really, we really do. We are noting our friends. We love each other. If you love each other, you, you, I mean, you get through anything. Get through anything. We're on each other's side. Uh, but I, I, I just say, take time for each other, respect one another, and love one another. And, and uh, it doesn't mean you don't argue. I can't understand people who live together 50 years and never argue. I mean, you're either deaf, dumb, or blind or something. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean you, can't, you can't live together without some kind of conflict. You can't do it. Huh? What'd she say, John? Oh, yeah. Back, yeah, back in, back in the early days, I said, Dodie, that's number two or number one. <laughs> But anyway, you know, you know, don't get the idea because you differ, you raise your voice, you say your piece, and do it from your, uh, your, your, from your neck up. You know, the biggest arguments Dodie and I have ever had. Five minutes later, she's sitting on my lap and I'm kissing the fire out of her. <laughs> Listen, folks. Just because there's snow on the roof doesn't mean there's no fire in the fireplace. <laughs> Somebody said, Brother Osteen, you and Dodie are over the hill. You just don't know what's on the other side of the hill. <laughs> Dodie doesn't like me to talk like that, but it's wonderful to know that love lasts. But don't get the idea, don't, don't get the idea that you, you know, because you have an argument that things are over. Don't you, you ever try to come to church with a, a car full of kids and stay spiritual? <laughs> Arguing and fussing and beating on each other. And Dodie and I got in an argument one day coming to, to church. I don't know what it was, something she said wrong. <laughs> but um, we got in an argument and, you know, a men are different. Men get over arguments real quick. Women, they fume. I mean, it, take, I mean they, it takes them a while to thaw out. If you know that, then you just get a torch and thaw them out, you know. <laughs> but um, we had this argument coming. I forgot, you know, I forgot that we, had, we were mad at each other. I totally forgot it. You know, I, to me, it was over. We Dodie and I sat on the platform during that time. I'm glad we finally got off, but... but uh, <laughs> We were sitting there, and I wanted to know a man's name sitting out there. I said, Dodie, what's that man's name? 
She said, I'm not going to tell you till you repent. <laughs> I'm sure people thought, I wonder what holy things they're discussing. <laughs> what marvelous revelation are they getting up there? I said, Dodie, I need to know his name. <laughs> repent. Nodi, I said, I'm the pastor of this church. Tell me his name. She said, I'll tell you his name when you repent. I said, I repent. She said, he's brother so-and-so. I got up and told, I asked brother so-and-so to do certain things, you know, but, but you know, that's what goes on. But, 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 but you know, we got over it. It didn't mean we didn't love each other. So, you know, just... I don't know why I'm telling you all these things. <laughs> what type of cash reserve do you operate on? Mucho. <laughs> you know, it's different in different years. We, we're, you know, when you've been living a long time, you've got a long time to gather things up, do things. But you ought to always have something to operate on in your personal life and in your church. Do you ever cut expenditures to balance the budget? Sometimes you get over, over, overstaffed. You hire somebody, and they want to hire, after a few months, they, they want you to hire somebody to do their work so they can watch them. <laughs> and then pretty soon, that person wants you to hire somebody to do their work so two of them can watch them. <laughs> so you get overbalanced. So sometimes you just have to just let a lot of people go because everybody's watching. You need the people to do the work. We, we only have about 35 employees in this great church. Let's see now. Will I answer that in these messages? Oh, when you have a guest ministry come to your church, when you do, do you pay their traveling expenses at hotel and then give them all the offering? No! No, sir, I'm not going to drain our church for somebody and give them $1,000 to go out of this building. I take out their travel expense. I, I take out their hotel and their food and give them the rest. Then I go get more than what's given. One fellow wanted uh, to come from California, and he insisted on two first-class tickets. I said, brother, I don't care if you rent a 747. It's all coming out of your offering. If you want first-class tickets... We're going to pay for it out of your offering. I don't think you ought to drain the church. I think every meeting ought to stand on its own two feet. Thank you for your enthusiasm. They get all the offering. But the expenses come out of that. Could I have an amen? <laughs> no, don't act like you agree with that, but that's all right. That's what we do. Why should the church be drained? Our church gives thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, even for one service. I know some of you say, let me come. <laughs> but at least it ought to bear itself. Could I have an amen? amen? Let's see. Um, You've been an encouragement to me and my wife through the years, and although I uh, live in England, I'd appreciate it if you'd be my pastor. I'll be your pastor. I'll be all of your pastors. Praise the Lord. So I take you in today. How do successful pastor, pastoral couple, scripturally pastor when both are teachers of the Word? Well, there's a difference between a teacher and a pastor. I'm the pastor of this church. Dodie has a marvelous ministry. And just because you're a teacher doesn't mean if you stand in the office of a teacher that you're in standing in the office of a pastor. You need to decide who, who's the pastor. And I tell the people, you're looking at the pastor right here. How do you handle financial reports. We give a verbal report every year to our church. 
Usually people that are called say, I want a financial report. They want to, we find out what they want to know, and then we tell them. If they want to know something they ought not to know, we don't tell them. But, uh, you know, we don't try to keep it in secrets. We just try to, well, at the year end, we tell them how much came in, how much we gave to missions, and the rest of it, you know. We don't give a detailed report. We have a small congregation, have problems of a few people run to the front, want to take the microphone and, and give prophecy and give revelation. Well, you know, you, you just have to, you have to just take charge and do what the Holy Ghost tells you to do. Don't let anybody run your church. Right now, we're not taking many prophecies. We, we, when we do, we have people come and they stand and we, they give prophecies and so forth. But I, right now, we just feel a, a little halt on all of that. And the world's not going to come to an end. You know, you just have to do what God tells you to do. Can you, can you share ministerial decisions with your wife? Why? That's a strange thing to put there. Well, you, well, you and your wife ought to be real close. You know, and, and Dodie and I are close, so we, you know, she knows pretty well what's going on. And uh, ought not to be a big secret, unless God tells you to keep it a secret. Well, let's see. Have you ever had anyone leave your church? Are you kidding? We have them leave all the time. Many of them write and tell us where they're going, why they're leaving. We pray over them and bless them as they go. And then sometime, you know, they find out they've left a good church and they'll come back. We love them. What is the government of your church? <laughs> you know, in every denominational church, there's one family or one man or one woman that runs it. Every Baptist church I had, there was a one man or woman uh, that had the big say so. You know, somehow churches realize that somebody ought to have the, have the last say or the first say. Well, it might as well be the man God put there. Amen? It doesn't mean you're a dictator. But somebody has to make the final decision. God so loved the world, he didn't send a committee. God put the pastor as the head of the local church. I personally do not believe in plural leadership. If you won't believe that, that's all right. But when God sent a message to the to the messenger, the leader of the church, uh, churches in, in Revelation, he, it was singular. To the leader. He didn't write to angels, to the leader of the church. God holds me responsible for this church. What do you think about the end time? You believe it's near? I believe, I believe our time is short to, to evangelize the world. Amen? Praise the name of the Lord. Well, I don't know whether I helped you or not, but I tried to answer some of those.